1989, November, the FMLN, which is the guerrilla that then became a political party in El Salvador, launched their final offensive, which was called Ofensiva Final Hasta el Tope, because that was their final push to take the capital. An intense urban fighting came into place around San Salvador, and they took hotels. One of the hotels that they took, they didn't realize at the time that a high commissioner of the UN was held captive there. And they fought with Marines, US Marines, for a long period of time, up until they realized that they messed up with somebody who wasn't supposed to be there and they released him and they, they let the guerrillas go away. And that was the turning point on that specific attack. And then negotiations took place for several peace agreements in this hotel that we are standing here. So this is somewhat an iconic place. San Salvador is full of history, bloody history. So there, there was this one congressman, Francisco Merino, and he has this incident with the police where he was drunk driving and he shot a policewoman. And this was a huge scandal. He's, uh, you, you, as you would imagine, his picture appeared in all the newspapers. And he was from a small party that was like a, like a swing party that, they, they, that decided. Uh, and back then the assembly was right-wing arena uh, related to the dead squads in the, in the war and guerrilla, FMLN. Because you cannot really arrest uh, a congressman. He's taken to a sort of impeachment trial. And in that process, Arena says, okay, we're gonna not impeach your congressman, but you're gonna give us the votes for the dollarization. It was not a matter of if this is convenient for the people, if this is what the people want, but it was a matter of do you have the votes and how can you get the votes because this is something that the elites want. In that moment, we have NAFTA. But the opposition was, uh, in that time, FMLN, for Gorilla, and you know, like, imperialism, Yankee intervention. Privatization of uh, the banks, the communications, uh, the electricity companies, everything. So that happened hand in hand with the dollarization? Yes, it was in 2001. Many call centers arrived to the country, and I'm an Italian speaker, so I got a job in an Italian account, and I got a very good salary. So for me, it was good to have the dollar. For the regular people, it was very bad. Sometimes it feels like you don't have another option. If you leave a call center, you will not find another job, or there will be nothing else that you can do with, uh, with I mean, where, where can I get money? So how am I going to survive? There was not a technical debate that was on the basis of the approval of the law. The people did not have immediately clear how and why would we benefit of changing our currency to the dollar. We were like trapped into the void of dollarization and the savage neoliberalism, you know, since that moment. There was essentially a rug pull that was financed by the lower income classes. There's no loans unless you have land. So our, our experience is that we, we've had to continue working, but as a collateral, we've been losing property after property. The dollar increase prices, increase uh, payments for rent, so I consider it uh, decreased the quality of life of the average population here in the country. For example, you could get a pound of tomatoes for five colones. One dollar, it's equal to 8.75 colones. So since that moment, you are not paying five colones, but you are paying a dollar. I'm sure inflation uh, slowed down a couple of points. I'm sure uh, colones would now be a lot uh, more worthless than they were back then. 
as a struggling society, it increased violence, it increased uh, the lack of opportunities for people. My neighbors, all of them, uh, move away to the United States. The friends I made from childhood, all of them move. Not having a, a salary or even a formal job, you know, we have almost 80% of informal uh, commerce here in the country. So not everyone has like the chance or even having a bank account in the country. So uh, the, the gap between rich and poor increased since the dollar uh, got here in the country. We were at the midpoint of being governed or ruled by a right-wing policy that implemented all the neoliberal policies existed, like directly from IMS, directly from uh, the Keynesian school, directly from whatever the multilaterals wanted. In hindsight, they were in cahoots with one another and co-governing. They, they saw homicide rates go up, they saw economical rates never take off, immigration kept surging towards the USA. It was like war. I actually was thinking we are in war, and nobody has declared it, but so many people is dying. People have been lied to, stolen from, <laughs> thrown in jail for nonsense for 30 years. In comes this savvy politician who is a mastermind of social media, who had been part of FMLN and knew them as a whole, but also was seen as a challenging, young, rebel kind of guy in the FMLN. For us, it's all about modernizing the country. Regardless if you agree or not with the government, we need to do this for El Salvador. It doesn't matter what, what type of ideology you have. And then he ran on the presidential race. His most famous slogan is, el dinero alcanza cuando nadie se lo roba, which is, there's enough money if people don't steal it. It's really about pushing our country forward so we can we can go into, into the future and make a better country for the new generations. He won a landslide election and he, again, uh, won a landslide election to control the majority of the Congress. And up to that point, so far, so good. There have been reforms and now it seems that the judicial branch is favorable to the Nueva Ciudad's party. So, I don't... There's, there's been a lot of hoorah in uh, Western press about this being a coup or some kind of undemocratic effort. And, you know, the facts don't lie if you put in the work to find out how this all played out. And so unless someone can prove to me that they stole the election somehow, they won fair and square and they are following their constitution. Political opposition to President Bukele lacks legitimacy because both the right-wing party, Arena, and the left-wing party, uh, FMLN, were really corrupt. This is the will of the people. And he is dearly loved and, and, and approved of by most people. I was six years in Congress, and then I uh, ran for president the first time. The political party was Arena, and I didn't finish the campaign. I saw too much corruption. We want El Salvador to become the next Singapore. Absolutely. And it's not just an idea that President Bukele has shared, you know, even publicly. I mean, you, you can read it once in a while in, on Twitter. He just tweets Singapore and that's it. But he, he's saying a lot with that. And for us, who, in my case, I, I work in tech investment, and I understand that anything and everything, education, health, water, everything relates to technology. And if we modernize the country and are able to bring investment, the necessary investment in order to make it run in a more efficient way, then yes, absolutely, we will become the next Singapore, at least in the Latin American region. And I can tell you that is the goal, yes. Everything started here. El Sonte is like a small village, like a surfing town, a fisherman town. The first tourists that came here were surfers. Surfing changed our life here, had been always part of our history of life. When we started using Bitcoin, our social project, 
Bitcoin Beach, Osante, started to be in the focus of many people all around the world. Many people that hear that in this little town, these guys, this group of young people, start to create the first circle of the economy all around the world based on Bitcoin. I have been witness. Yes, there's still crime at El Sonte. We cannot deny it. Yes, there's still garbage thrown away, but not as much as it were a couple of years ago. We came working from more than 10 years ago with this big dream to change our community to, and how we're gonna change our community, giving tools to the young people that they can start to fight for their dreams here and stop dreaming to go to the United States and work in there. The government realized that this was a way to implement these main ideas of values and freedom and, 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 and inclusion and, and prevention of violence and education and how this can be recreated elsewhere. And I think that's what we inherited from the El Sonte program. This dream started here in Sonte. We never thought that our project will inspire a nation adopting Bitcoin as a legal tender. The first time I heard about this was uh, from a conference in Miami Beach from a white guy who says that now he, and he's introducing the president of my country and says, this is going to be your legal tender. President Bukele was running as a candidate for the presidential election. A lot of proposals, if you will, were given to the population. And there's actually a digital agenda on the president's website that anybody can have access to. It's also in English. And they can see the pillars in which we are focusing on as a country. However, uh, Bitcoin was not included in that digital agenda in 2019. However, we saw the need to adopt anything that could take us faster in a more consistent way into the future. So the logical thing to do was to move forward and adopt the most uh, famous, well-known, and in this case, secure coin, and that was Bitcoin. It was a no-brainer. In short, sweet terms, it made Bitcoin legal tender in El Salvador, period. With all of the legal implication that that has. I would say that when Bitcoin law uh, came down, this was kind of a repetition of the dollarization bill, but faster. Bitcoin law was announced on a Sunday and on Wednesday, it was approved as a legal tender in El Salvador. And you could probably say a lot of the same technical critics that you say to the legislation, you could also just translate 20 years in the future uh, and say the same about Bitcoin. It was like a pretty cool decision. So it was a surprise, a surprising thing for everyone in the country and even for Bitcoiners of the country. The legal community, but us, they thought that this was full gold that was being introduced into the economic system. So uh, I think it's like a, a battle, you know, between education and no education and an open-minded idea uh, for people to let them know what can they do with a tool that could like uh, give us freedom. The risk here is uh, to be free. So I consider people doesn't know about the benefits of being free because they always been like, uh, I don't know, what the government says or other sets, you know, but it's time for us to get personal sovereignty and decided about a uh, real free. President Bukele is immensely popular, like hitting 80% charts and, and approval rates. And Bitcoin was the first unpopular move that he made. What is the long-term effect that this is gonna have, right? This decision 
made for us is gonna have. And I think that the most part of the fear that, it, that we have as a population is that when we got dollarized, it was the same speech about like having two legal currencies, but it, it went, um, the, the Colón went out of circulation because we don't know why. We have been going to these rural places and these small towns outside of the capital, outside of San Salvador, and the Salvadorian perspective has been a very political perspective. So um, people in the, um, all, honestly, all around the country, but most part in the rural um, zones in the country that they don't know a thing about Bitcoin. They just think that this is a Bukele's coin or, or this is similar to the dollar or they think that the dollar is gonna disappear after this. That's all they have heard from the television, from the news. Like in any democracy, I think opposition is healthy. I actually think they will, they will be there in any country and they should be there in order to balance power. But at the same time, it's interesting to see that people who are against the president or who are against the government are also against Bitcoin just because you need to be against, you know, anything that the government does. And that's a huge mistake because they're not really informing themselves or educating themselves in regards to what Bitcoin can do for them, in regards to gaining not only financial freedom, but at the same time, allowing them to save and to invest in another medium that is the future. So yes, there were people who were against it. There were organizations who were against it. But at the end of the day, we knew that this was the right thing to do. The government had a big issue, even with the Bitcoin community, on the Article 7 of the law, which says it's mandatory. That's not being really implemented. So the government is not enforcing that part of the law. And so that's made people kind of like, okay, it's not gonna affect me. I don't have to buy into it. I went out to the park to do some exercise. It was a Sunday. Normally on a Sunday there's almost nobody there. But there were some people there, and I remember, oh, that there was a protest that's going to be today. There were four types of people in that protest. It was some rich people who comes in big vans, in big uh, cars. You know, there's been an, another inflation with the Bitcoins. You can ask people. Tell me a bit about that. I believe that since the Bitcoin was adopted as a legal currency, I believe that prices went around 40 to 50 percent inflation and probably it will come to more. Everything, if you go to the grocery, you do your groceries, if you go to a restaurant, they have a few percentage around 40 and 50 percent. They're not going to tell you the owners of the restaurants. But if you know the prices and you go again and you see the prices with the Bitcoins, it came up. Everything has come up. If you go to the, to where people buy their groceries, not the supermarket, it's like a central area where you buy, uh, you know, less than the grocery. People are gonna tell you that they got a little percentage more because they don't know what's going to happen with Bitcoin. If it's going to go up, going to go down, if it's going to be stable or not. The Bitcoin is, it's, it's like this. I mean, it's not every second, it's moving. You know, you have seen the application, it's moving every second. But they made this because they don't have any choice. They don't have more dollars. So they're going to run out of money. And that's why they're, their plan B is a Bitcoin. You said there were four types. Yes. Rich people. Rich people. Very, very poor people who came from other uh, faraway places from the country. Very clearly, you can see on the streets when you, if you, if you went to the protest, it wasn't about Bitcoin. The anti-Bitcoin idea was just the one flag that they could raise that somehow got more people to show up. But there were many concerns being expressed by people uh, out in, in the protest, but that was like the one thing that they could cling on to. Journalists. Bitcoin plays into the grand scheme of things because it allows him to have positive attention 
of the world and presents himself as this cool, savvy president politician to the world when he internationally and nationally he has been critiqued and questioned over these authoritarian tendencies. And young people like me who is really convinced that, convinced that Bitcoin is a bad thing for the country. So for me, uh, the last, the last uh, type of people that I, that I describe is, are the royal protesters. Like, they, they actually think that it's a, it's a bad thing, that there is corruption in the, go in the government. And when I saw in the media big protests in El Salvador, I was like, that's not real. <laughs> I mean, Salvadorians don't fully support Bitcoin, like knowing what it is and it's going to be the best thing for our country. We are not like that, but also we don't oppose to, to it. If you are against the government, you will see, you will be against Bitcoin without even like getting to know really what it is. There is a very vocal and vociferous opposition, but they keep painting themselves into a corner where they could have understood that Bitcoin was their greatest ally, and yet, for whatever reason, they've chosen to cancel themselves out of Bitcoin, at least for the first semester. We'll see how next year plays out. Take people from zero to one. We're teaching uh, basic stuff, basic concepts about Bitcoin, and try to guide them on how to use wallets, for example, how to identify different concepts from Bitcoin, like centralized or decentralized. We're talking about wallets in general and, and what's a non-custodial wallet, or what is a custodial wallet. We changed the, the mindset about money, about what people are used to be, how we grew up thinking that money is, is uh, something that you can touch. And to explain that to people that they never have access to the bank account, they never have access to the credit card, to the debit card, to start to understanding what is digitally money and just jump into the Bitcoin now. It's, it's exciting, it's exciting, but it took time. And there are some people that get it, they understand it in the beginning and their life have been changing. We won't be able to dream about becoming the next Singapore if we do not push for education. Providing the necessary space for more programmers and developers because those are really uh, the careers of the future. At the same time, right now that Bitcoin is legal, allowing people on the street, you know, the, the regular citizen who sells uh, gum or candies on the street, to teach them how to use the Chivo wallet or any other wallet, it doesn't matter, as long as they use Bitcoin. But the key will be in not just the government, but also academia and the private sector to unite in order to do this. The first student that I got, he's an Uber driver. And actually, after I think that it was the second class, he got a, at least a general idea how receive Bitcoin, how transactions work on change and on lighting. And he says, well, uh, now that we are, we are getting a lot of people from other countries, they're gonna get interested if they can make a payment in Bitcoin. And he did a, a, a fair amount of sats on his trips and I, I meet him the, the past week and ask him, hey, be honest, what do you do with those sats? And he said, hey, I'm holding. We start to see how we can use it in the social initiative and paying the English classes with Bitcoin, paying the young people to clean it. Not paying, but giving them like a bonus, you know, that they can use it in the pupuseria, they can use it to buy internet, to be able to to do their homeworks, you know? And some families had also like a problem to find like a job, and so we started offering like jobs and paying with Bitcoin. This was the beginning of this big movement that now we all know and everyone know about Bitcoin Beach. I didn't have to know how to program. We, we just have to do small tasks. And I was able to do it whenever I wanted. And they had the option to pay through 
PayPal or Bitcoin. So at the beginning, I started asking pay me through PayPal. With the logic inconveniences of anti-money laundering regulations being as strong as they are in a country as violent as El Salvador, we are a pass-through country from Colombia and South America to the U.S., which means that the narcos use us as an intermediate point, and this is something that has made the U.S. government and other international government agencies to force El Salvador to implement huge anti-money laundering regulations. I used to hold it, and uh, they paid me each week. When I had a, a big amount, I used to bring it to the country because PayPal is banned from the country. You cannot bring money if you, if you have it in PayPal. I used to send it from my PayPal account to a friend of mine, and he used to send it to me through Western Union. On that, uh, doing that, I used to lose 20% of my, of my money. So it was really hard for me, but that was the only way I had. My bank accounts are being closed. I am being investigated by the Fiscalia uh, because they, uh, I, I have been doing irregular transactions coming from anywhere in the world to my bank account. Now with Bitcoin, they deposit, deposit it directly to my wallet. I don't lose almost anything. For most people, Bitcoin is still only a governmental subsidy, something that you open up an app in a cell phone and it allowed you to have $30 to use in something. A friend of mine, she asked me, can you do us a drawing? Can you make a drawing of us? And when she was going to pay me, she was like, I can deposit to your bank account because she was in San Miguel, I was here in San Salvador. It was a Saturday night. And she said, on Monday, I will wake up early and I will go to the bank. I will be careful because of COVID. I don't like waking up early, but I will have to go. I will deposit your money. And I was like, you can just send me the payment through Bitcoin. And she was like, oh, really? And it was a matter of some minutes. I mean, in a matter of minutes, I had the money in my wallet. She said, oh my God, that's a relief. I didn't know it was that fast. I have received several payments through that way. Was this after the $30 from Chivo? Yes. Being a legal tender now allows us to easily convert from US dollar to for, or any fiat currency to Bitcoin and vice versa. It's seamless. It's delightful in the sense that as a, as a small business person, I am able to reduce operating costs, financial costs, from having to go through the usual suspects or, or, or the financial institutions. Here in El Salvador, we don't, we don't really use Unchained that much because the fees are very high and uh, we're making a lot of transactions per day. So we prefer to use the Lightning Network because it's, um, it's faster and it's easier and no fees in the most, most of the cases or fees are very low. We had the espresso bar. Everybody that came, at least 80% of, of uh, individuals, particularly requested Lightning Network to make their transactions. So I was happy to also learn about the various wallets out there and the pros and the cons. It was a pleasant experience, so it wasn't as hard as one imagines. The first patient I had paying in Bitcoin was a 64-year-old person. That it's a construction worker. He doesn't know how to read, but he has a lightning wallet, you know? So he had a previously education in the use of a lightning wallet. The value of money, our crowdfunding, Bitcoin Smiles. We have currently uh, 1.8 Bitcoin to work and provide critical dental care for the impoverished communities. So Bitcoin fixes teeth as well. When Bitcoin comes to our community, we start to see people saving money for the first time. People buying like an asset for the first time. Small merchants transacting digitally, accepting payment, making digitally payment for the first time. For many people, this is, sounds like, not like a big issue, right? Because you don't see the problem if you don't live in the problems. But for people from Europe, from the United States, from Canada, 
maybe when they go to the coffee shop and they order a coffee, it's, it's, it's normal to get like a, a debit card, a credit card and pay digitally. But that's a luxury that not everyone has all around the world. That Bitcoin has been representing that for this side of, of the world, you know, giving access to our population. 70% of our population in El Salvador didn't have access to the financial system, to the actual financial system. But now, more than 4 million people in El Salvador have access to the new financial system. They can receive their remittance in, in their wallet without someone that say, no, you cannot do it. We all can use it in different ways and every human people can benefit from that. It just understanding what Bitcoin representing for you for us have been representing access to the financial system. For the majority of the people, they see Bitcoin just like an asset, but people need to understand also that Bitcoin is a monetary network. This concept is for people to understand, is like Bitcoin is gonna be like internet. Bitcoin is gonna be in the center. Our purpose is to establish a genuine direct trade relationships with our final consumers as uh, we're roasting here at Origin and exporting directly to customers who are willing to pay via Lightning Network, eliminating financial institution high commission and another transaction costs associated with banks down here. Satoshi Blend is an idea of financial freedom. We chose the Sampacho varietal of our Arabica harvest, as well as the Red Bourbon, because of the quality and because of the association and meaning it has related to the coffee rust disease that impacted coffee producer countries a decade ago. We call it green bean or gold. This is our gold. This is our, our Bitcoin. The grid matrix that we have allows us to take advantage of the geothermal power uh, alternative to the petroleum uh, oil, bunker oil fuel. So here where we are now near Guatemala, we're about one kilometer north of La Geo. They have a headquarters here in Aguachapan also. And as you drive, you can see all the, all the gas coming out of the, the mountains and the volcanoes. So all that will enable us also to maybe in the future have another cluster of, 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 of uh, Bitcoin mining activity. The day the video of President Bukele during the Bitcoin 2021 conference uh, was broadcasted, he went on a, on a Twitter space along with many other people, right? So we all followed him. He was asked, so what do you think about mining? Is El Salvador going to mine Bitcoin? And right at that time, just out of the blue, and I'm saying it wasn't something that had been planned ahead of time, he, he said, well, we have plenty of volcanoes. In fact, we have 23 volcanoes in, in El Salvador. And he said, I think we should we should mine with our volcano energy. And it blew everybody's minds because we hadn't even thought about it, honestly. It shows you two things. One, how something that perhaps had not been thought of around the world can be done in a country like El Salvador, one of the tiniest countries in all of Latin America. And two, how we also have a leader who's not only a millennial, but an innovator. and. We have a, uh, a mining plant in Berlin, Usulutan, and it's, uh, it's utilizing geothermal energy. The plant is surrounded by volcanoes, and it's just incredible that we're actually doing this, but at the same time that we're also getting support from other companies. It's great that they will have more investment in new energy infrastructure. They need to have more energy to produce and, and, and develop and available in El Salvador from Salvadorian sources. There's a lot of opportunity and I hope that Salvador becomes the you know, pioneer and world leader of geothermal energy. My understanding is that geothermal in El Salvador, for it to go to mining, would need to be new geothermal. And we need to know more about the lead times there.
if a person from another country tell you, hey, what do you, what is your opinion on Bitcoin or what do you think of Bitcoin? Salvador is going to give you an honest answer. Hey, I don't know. I don't understand. But if you, if you say, do you want to, you know, maybe I will share some knowledge of Bitcoin with you, they're going to, maybe I'm exaggerating, but I, I'm fully sure that a 99% of Salvadorians is going to say, yeah, uh, let's talk about Bitcoin. And even if they don't accept Bitcoin, they're going to say, yeah, let's talk about Bitcoin. And they really appreciate that you are sharing with it, with them knowledge. If you meet someone that's anti-Bitcoin in El Salvador, please be patient and listen to their arguments because you will realize that they're just confused and they just need someone to help guide them along their orange pill journey. I see many tourists that when they come here, they sit with the locals and talking. And it's really exciting seeing tourism changing their mindset about Bitcoin. And the locals also have their ears more open to learn from there because in places like El Salvador or Latin America, we grew up thinking that the bad things are in Europe, the bad things are in Canada, in the United States. But when people come here and they're super exciting and they're like, wow, this is a big dream, but it's like a big dream of everyone. Seeing tourism changing their mindset and saying like, well, before I came to El Salvador, I didn't want to spend my thoughts, my Bitcoin. But once I'm here, I'm more willing to do it, to help people. Because Bitcoin representing that, Bitcoin representing that chance to make this place a better place for this generation, but also for the next generation that are coming. The government cannot educate its entire population on Bitcoin or on any other related topic. We need help and we have to do it hand in hand with the academia, with uh, companies, meaning the private sector and investors from the outside or companies who have started arriving into El Salvador, opening offices and uh, recruiting staff. And I've been seeing it because I've been onboarding many of these companies. So if we all work together, the, exper the, the Bitcoin experiment in El Salvador is going to be a success. And we all want it to be a success because if, if it works out here in a country that has a population of 6.5 million, it's going to work out anywhere. We just need to keep on pushing and educating our population. We believe that hyper-Bitcoinization is the most important race of the 21st century. And for whatever reason, Central America has a unique situation where we are perfectly poised to win that race. We think it's the only race that will matter in the 21st century. So everything we can do to increase the odds of Central America winning that race, we are here to do. La Unión is, is one of the departments, the 14 departments that make up El Salvador. And when the announcement was made last Saturday by the president of Bitcoin City to reactivate the economic activity in the East, for all of us, we were very happy because it's progress for the country. That means less people are going to have to migrate to the city. It's going to decentralize. Bitcoin City is going to be built very close to San Miguel, where I was born its cultural context. What does it mean for a Salvadorian? What does it mean that this Bitcoin city is going to be built in La Union and not in the center of the country? Historically, those cities have been uh, abandoned or in the oblivion because through all our history in El Salvador, every development, every improvement has been in the capital city. It will give opportunities to the people who live there and they will not have to move to leave their families. For a government 
that has a deficit in its budget, it needs to get new liquidity from creditors. Traditional creditors, the lender of last resort, the IMF, is the only one on the table right now for El Salvador for the traditional fiat lending to see if El Salvador can extend beyond the 100% debt to GDP to, you know, United States levels of 130 debt to GDP. But in order to do that, obviously there are some considerable strings attached. And I try to put myself in their shoes. If your party is known as Nuevas Ideas, literally new ideas, and in order to finance them, the one person that shows up at the table is the lender of last resort, and their financing comes with all of these strings. Essentially, you're being asked to go from the party of new ideas to call yourself the party of new ideas, but financing the same old ideas. So I can understand perfectly why they have chosen to stick their middle finger in, the, in front of the IMF. But I don't even know if it's just that. I think they are playing them. I think what they realize is that their Bitcoin at this point has matured to the point where there's another player that they can sit down at the table with, and that's Bitcoin. It seems that in this iteration, it's Blockstream and Bitfinex, and great for them. I think what they are demonstrating is that nation states that are facing a similar situation to what El Salvador is facing with fiat in the petrodollar system have another um, option, have a lifeboat, a life raft that they can grab onto the same way that many individuals that have found Bitcoin have seen Bitcoin as a life raft. So I believe that they're still negotiating with the IMF. There's still a possibility that the IMF gives them, provides some sort of financing. But for this new financing, is it different? It can be. We'll have to look at the details in the bond. You know, how, how is it structured? What are the rules? Like, what is an investor actually buying? But it would seem that through Liquid, the side chain where these bonds are going to be available, almost anyone in the world is going to be able to buy these in small amounts as well. So it's a brave new world, really, for for financing states that are leading their people in the direction that other creditors are willing to support. So as long as the government uses those proceeds well, and so the conditions that I saw was 50% for the purchase of Bitcoin for custody. I'd love to see the details on who's custodying, you know, how is that multi-sig going to work? It would be very good to know. But then the remaining 500 million is supposed to be invested in Salvadorian energy and other kinds of infrastructure to lay the groundwork for a Bitcoin city. So if we do not see results from those investments, and this is the case every, in every, every country on the planet, of all this financing that comes from the traditional fiat petrodollar, and it's like, oh yeah, they paid $100 million for a port that never showed up. So. Um, if now you're relying on a creditor that has the ability to, you know, take their money off the table and not seen as a, as a creditor of last resort, then they have to keep our interest, right? We'll see if uh, Bitcoiners actually play, play it like, that way. And, and, and if there is corruption, if they are stealing the money, will Bitcoiners no longer buy the bots, right? That we'll, we'll have to verify. And for now, my, my message would be just don't trust, verify. As Salvadorian, I feel really proud to be in the middle of the public eye. Not for bad things, not for a war not for gangs, not from violence, not from being the murder capital of the world. I will talk to my grandchildren that I lived in this, in this era of change. This is our version of the fall of the wall of Berlin. It's the adoption of Bitcoin and it's, gonna, it's sending shockwaves around the world. I consider that Bitcoin, it's a tool that it's going to change humanity, the change we are living in. 
and it's going to provide hope. In our case, our country suffers too much and it's time to stop suffering. It's time to believe in ourselves. It's the time for take action. We need the most help from everywhere in the world of people that really understand our into Bitcoin and really understand the benefits. And if they have a way to um, provide something and help us as a community to grow. El Salvador is making history, is leading this new revolution, is leading this new dream, this new freedom. I have 25 years old and I never get any kind of interest in politics. I mean, I hear my father, I hear my uncles, even so my grandfathers hear about politics and, and things like that. But I never, never see on my kid days, on my John's days, anything that politics really do and generate an impact here on the suburb. And you know what happens that we, we came, we came out from a civil conflict. It's not, not too, too much time has passed after that. And I think that the goons uh, was still fresh a couple of decades ago. And that is the main reason that politics never did something that generates an impact. And what happens now is that President Nadia Bukele came and actually begins to see things that a lot of people see, you know? As example, if you ask me, the previous president, what does he do that benefits you or generate an impact in your life? My honest answer is gonna be, I don't know. But if my kids in the future ask me what President Najib Bukele did in his time that makes an impact on your life, my answer is gonna be, Bitcoin, hey. We come from being forced into adopting political views, political uh, ways of thinking from both ends, from the communist and capitalist that haven't done any good for us as Salvadorians. We have been forced either you're with one side or with the other and I will kill you if you do not agree with me. And that led to a civil war, and that led to coups, and that led to be us being one of the poorest economies in the world. And now with this, I see it as a game changer. I, I, I used to draw in my art dead people or violence. And now, and I realized that El Salvador was exporting feelings of death feelings, very, very negative feelings, because that's what our history, that's what we live. But I don't want, and that's, I want to, to stress that a lot. I don't want to be like that anymore. That's, a, the, I, can, I can tell that's the general feeling of the population. We don't want to be like that anymore. We want to live that in the past. The spirit of the country was lost. The spirit of the country was death. And now we can at least dream of, of something that keeps us alive, that makes us think maybe our sons or daughters will not have to go to the United States to live. Maybe we will not have to say goodbye to them anymore.
would really challenge the question that it's changing El Salvador's lives uh, for people. Uh, it's PR and it's too soon for actually to be changing the lives of millions of people.